right say Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ I'm ready to receive your words I'm ready to receive your unction I'm ready to receive your favor I'm ready to receive your blessing thank you that it comes from your word flows in my heart and reaches every aspect of my life in Jesus mighty name amen and amen praise God now guys before you take your seats it would just be uh, amiss of me uh, not to just invite Pastor Michael just to, to say a few words you can even read a nursery rhyme we'll still be blessed but Pastor Michael was such a mentor in my life and such a blessing and uh, I'm sure a great part of the reason why I've been in ministry and accelerated in the divine order was the impartation that his words had in my life. You know, somebody can, uh, it, it's amazing how God does it in the kingdom of heaven. Somebody can actually father you by their words. It's remarkable. You may never know the person. I've never met personally Kenneth Copeland ever. But his words have fathered me. And I've grown up as a son of his. And also, uh, Pastor Michael was, was a great father and a great mentor to me in the late 80s. So I just want us to clap for him first. And just a couple of minutes, Michael, just to bring a greeting. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Well, God bless you. It's wonderful to see your faces again. This is like our home too, you know. I mean, we've been here so many times and uh, the anointing I sense, you know, from uh, many days back is here as well. And I want to let you know that you're very blessed to be alive at this hour. Amen. We have moved into a new level of anointing. Uh, I do a lot of study about timelines and I follow the timelines back. You know, we're in the Jubilee year. Uh, there's so many exciting things, but I'm going to tell you this. Take only a few minutes, maybe a minute. Mary had a little lamb. The fleece was white as snow. <laughs> and everywhere Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. The lamb is Jesus Christ. Yeah. Amen. And he's white as snow. And his name is going to cover the whole earth. His glory shall cover it. And he's going to use you and me. The head is Christ. The body is Jesus, us, Jesus Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The two witnesses in the earth, I declare, is the head and the body. Amen. And we're going to take over. We're going to drain the swamp. Amen. You're going to be so anointed. We're coming into a whole new anointing. Amen. The Pentecostal anointing was great, but their Bible says it was the down payments. It was just the earnest. That's come to an end. In 1993, I found out, we've moved into tabernacles. There's a tabernacle anointing coming to the earth, and it's far greater. The Spirit will fall like it did in the day of Pentecost, and it poured out upon His people, but it was only a down payment. It's going to come again, Pastor. There's going to be a time when the Spirit will come again with the full anointing. The seven spirits in the body. And we will be that which the Bible says is about to happen where the whole earth, I believe, is groaning. Don't you believe right now? They're groaning, waiting for the sons of God to manifest. You and I are that sons and those daughters of God. So the anointing is coming, folks. I want you to get very excited with me. The anointing is different. It's different. It's a new anointing. The things that I do, you shall do also. And greater than these shall you do, because I go unto the Father. That has not happened yet. In the time of Pentecost, they only saw the down payment. It was great. But now we're going to come into a new anointing where the miracles that we want to see will be experienced by you and me in the earth. The blind will see. The lame will walk. We're going to see miracles after miracles because the head and body coming into agreement with harmony with God's Word is about to take place. So get excited. Remember, Mary had a little lamb. Fleece was white as snow. And 
wherever Mary went, the Lamb was sure to go. And He's going to be in you and through you like never before. Give Jesus all the glory, all the praise. And I thank God for your pastors. Wonderful blessings. God bless you, sir. Thank you so much. Praise the living God. Matthew chapter 16. And uh, I want to share with you something today, a continuation of what I've been ministering to you on about the Jesus administration. You know, we've had, uh, as they say in America, you know, we've had the Clinton administration. We've had the uh, Bush administration. We've had the uh, Obama administration, and now we're in the Trump administra administration, and uh, it's enough to keep anyone on their knees, amen, uh, seeing what's happening in the world right now. But there is such a thing as the Jesus administration, and uh, I want to go a stage higher than that. I want to talk to you this morning about something called jurisprudence. Anyone know what that means? People were saying, Pastor P, that's a big word for you with a guy, a guy with two O levels. Uh, Ronke knows. Oh, you did law, did you? Anyone else study law? Oh, you did, Tony. Wow, wow. Okay, and, and Mary Mad. We might need your legal services later. Praise God. Um, jurisprudence. It's a very interesting concept, and it's, the, it's effectively the philosophy or the foundation on which laws are made. Um, we have a jurisprudence in the United Kingdom which has basically changed over the last, what, 20 to 30 years, maybe longer, uh, from what was a biblically-based legal system in the UK to what's called now secular relativism. Now, I'm going somewhere in this because, you see, no matter what is happening out in the world you can have a different jurisprudence in your home. Amen. The philosophy of the law that you live by, the Bible says that we live by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And just as Pastor Michael said, the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, if that dwells in you, then that will quicken your mortal body. It will make you come alive, but it will also enable you to accomplish things that weren't possible under a previous system. So making Jesus Lord of your life, a lot of the time, we, we in the body of Christ, uh, we, we almost make light of it in that, you know, well, if you say a prayer, uh, the sinner's prayer, then bang, heaven is your home. Uh, and, you know, thank God for that. But, you know, it was that simple for the guy on the cross beside Jesus. Do you remember him? Yeah. And uh, he, said, uh, he said, Lord, be merciful to me. And Jesus said, he said, this day I'll be, I'll be, you, I'll be with you, or oh, you'll be with me in paradise. In other words, you know what? Heaven has uh, entered you as a result of your desire to see it enter you. The Bible says that by our, our words of our mouths, we are saved. And you see, there, there's that. But then there's the continuing in his word that causes you to become a disciple indeed so that you can know the truth and the truth that you know and apply can then make you free. Right, So there's this, uh, this ability. The Bible says that, that, that on the inside of us, there's a groaning. He says the Spirit helps us in our weakness with, with groans, inarticulate groans that are too deep for human speech. There's desires uh, to see God's kingdom come and to see his will be done, uh, not just on the physical outward earth, but in us. How many of you can say amen? amen? How many of you have been sick and you've wanted, you know, I want to be well again. And it's almost like we don't realize the, the, the gift that our health is until it says bye-bye. And then it's like, oh, come back, hurry, come back. And you see, there's, there's something on the inside of us when you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. There's something on the inside of you that can uh, call upon that healing. There, there's something on the inside of you the, the, that can make you know that it belongs to you. Yes. Healing belongs to us. Jesus said it's the children's bread. Yes. 
So there's something in us that can uh, latch on to that truth and take that truth and swallow it. Jesus said, I'm the true bread which came down from heaven. I was praying once about a particular uh, uh, situation in my life. And the Lord said to me, he said, what you need is the true bread. I said, wow, dude, give it to me, please. That, that, that was all I want. I just said, Lord, I don't even know. You know, sometimes we don't even know what we're asking for. Why? Because that spirit on the inside of us that leads us and guides us, that's from a different regime. That's from the Jesus administration. You, you can't get that outside in the world. There's certain things that the world just doesn't know uh, belongs to us. They, they, it, it doesn't know that it's ours because it's yet to come into that which Christ has given us. And there's a whole system of government that we can live by. A whole Jewish prudence, jurisprudence, a whole philosophy of law. And the way I saw it in my spirit is that I can, I can take, in, in the realm of the spirit, I saw myself holding my Bible above my head and saying, Lord, I choose to live by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. I choose to live by that law. If there's any other law outside, Lord, I refuse it. I refute it. Uh, I don't want to live by any other law than your law, your ways, your words, your life, your blessing. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm resonating with some people here. And, you know, outside in the world, Jesus warned us. He said, you know, the world will go from bad to worse. I mean, from crazy to downright crazy. You know, we, we were arguing a few years ago in the UK about something like gay marriage, where, like, you know, one person of one particular XX chromosome wanted to marry somebody of a similar XX chromosome. And leaving out the X, Y. And that was a huge debate and everything like that. And those of us who live by the word of God were saying, hang on a second. You know, for, us, for a marriage to be biblical, you need an XX and an XY and an X. You see, the X is the cross of Jesus Christ. And the XX is the male. Is that right? And then the XY is the female. Can you tell I was totally uneducated? <laughs> XY is the male. Thank you. Thank you. X... <laughs> 2-0 level self, trying to explain jurisprudence. Praise the living God. I serve the God of the impossible. Praise his holy name. And so, so there, was this, there was this massive debate about whether it could happen. But, you know, things have moved further on than that. Now they're talking about three and four person marriages. Four people marching down the aisle. I sent a thing, you know, I've got this great friend in, uh, in Israel. His name is Israel Levinson. He's a mighty man of God. He lives in Hebron, like just a few miles from Gaza. So there's rockets firing, you know, over his head all the time coming in from Gaza to hit Israel. But uh, he doesn't care. He's a real man of faith, loves God. And uh, he, he, I, I, was, I sent him this link this morning because we were talking. I told him what I was going to be preaching on today. And he said, oh, so like, you know, what's the content? So... Um, I said, for instance, I said, uh, in America, there's a guy who's married his horse. Some of you are saying, never. <laughs> Shaking your head and going, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, you can imagine the bride walking down the aisle with a nose bag. You know, you got some carrots in your pocket just to keep it quiet. During the service, what a nonsense. What a nonsense. But this is, you see, what's that? You see, you cannot live under the jurisprudence of the word of God and engage in such activities. It's impossible. The, the Bible said they'd go from bad to worse. And I, I looked through history. This is an amazing thing. Because really, one of the, one of the, one of the major disservices that the, the, the ministry has done to the body of Christ is that we, we haven't looked back into the history of how the free world firstly became the free world and also, though, how the free world engaged in the legal system that it did. And you can trace all of the redemptive laws back to the Bible you can trace every single one of them back to the word of God. You can trace the desire, for instance, to raise up 
nursing and hospitals back to the Bible. You can trace things like remedial prisons, prisons before Christianity uh, actually took the idea of incarceration on and a redemptive incarceration that previously they would sit them all in dungeons and you know if you were sentenced to 10 years I was just thinking of Dudley and Gloria 46 years married this week now you get you get less for double murder so so I'm joking Gloria. I'm sure you're an awesome one uh, but um, you, you imagine before redemptive incarceration that people would be there, they'd be chained in a prison, wouldn't care whether they live or die, wouldn't care whether they ate or drank or anything like that. Care for prisoners? Ha! Ah. But yet, you see, biblical teaching, and you can trace this all back through Christianity, uh, university education, all the first universities were all Christian universities, and they were founded in cities that were Christian cities. You had a bishop in a, the, before a place could be called a city, you had to have a bishop there. And as a result of the bishop being there, then it raised up a university. So there's this joke about Oxford. You know, this young guy went to Oxford, and he said, uh, which college did you choose? He said, Emmanuel College, because all the others were named after Jesus. <laughs> and that's... And that's Unfortunately, that's how uh, things have, have, have gone, you see? Now, what the world lives under right now, what the West lives under right now is a thing called secular relativism. And it basically goes like this. It, it, it basically says, if I'm of a consenting age and whoever else I'm doing whatever else with is of a consenting age, then they can consent to do whatever it, it, it goes on as long as it doesn't result in the immediate loss of life or limb. That's what it is. So, so uh, for instance, under our Jewish pr jurisprudence, I'm keep, I keep calling it Jewish prudence, jurisprudence under our rule of law, pedophilia is outlawed because the person is uh, underage. But then you can go to certain parts of the world, which for the sake of political correctness, I can't name, like Saudi Arabia, <laughs> and, and a whole different jurisprudence exists. I was reading, in, in the, uh, I was reading Wikipedia that there's no penal code in Saudi Arabia for rape. No penal code. That's from Wikipedia. Strange, very strange. You see, in the West, we don't know. In the free world, we don't know what we have until it's gone. How many people in ministry have been like that? They've been a light to so many people. And then people just took them for granted and just, you know, let them go about their way. And what do they say? Familiarity breeds contempt. And you, you didn't know what that person was in your life until they were gone. Boom. So we, we've, we've got to treasure, understand the treasure that God gives us. Even scripturally, the Bible says this treasure, talking about the presence of God in our lives, he says this treasure we hold in earthen vessels. That basically, this is the Paolo version, that the glory of God may be manifested in the world. And actually, the darker the world gets, the brighter we shine. Why? We are living under a different jurisprudence if you've never made the decision you see you can make uh, the decision to follow Jesus and for him to be your savior but you see for him to be your lord then you need to be living under his jurisprudence doing it God's way and I don't know whether you've noticed this but some sometimes God's way seems like the hard way Jesus said it himself. He said that the, the, the man who hears my word and does it, he shall be likened unto a man who built his house upon a rock. How many of you, you've ever had to dig into rock to do a foundation or to do uh, like, you know, if there's a big massive boulder in your back garden and you want to get rid of it? My brother and sister is hideous. It's really, you know, I had to break rocks. I can't even remember why. I do remember why. Imagine this, the Bishop of Galway in the west of Ireland 
used to use, use us. I was part of a youth team work, uh, like, you know, I used to work with uh, travelers and uh, ex-cons and, you know, like people with no hope, no future, etc. And he paid a few of us to sort of gather up a team and we would go around and, and just do good stuff in the community. So if a, a lady's house needed painting or whatever, make sure she lock up her valuables and then call <laughs> us, you know? And, uh, and so I used to be involved in that in the west of Ireland. And then the Bishop of Galway, one day he's decided his back garden needed doing. Lord have mercy, the size of this dude's back garden. Honestly, probably twice the length of this auditorium here. The guy's back garden. And, and we had to go there, we had pickaxes. He said, oh yeah, I've got some concrete that needs breaking. So we went there with pickaxes and all that sort of stuff. Health and safety, forget it. No gloves, no uh, specs. You know, if a concrete chip just flies in your eye, then just go hospital and, and kind of they'll, they'll try and, you know, either pull it out or fix it. And uh, so we were knocking away at this concrete the whole day. And we had cold tea and sandwiches. Lord have mercy. And, and you know, that was tough. Digging into rock was tough. And Jesus said, you know, he said, if you're going to do, if you can paraphrase that whole he who hears my word and does it thing to be likened with, sometimes the journey is going to be a lot longer than the guy who hears my words and doesn't do it. Because the guy who hears the words and doesn't do it, he can buy the same pre-packed house from Ikea and he can have that thing up and shining in a couple of days. Why? He's not had to dig a foundation. He's just laying the thing out on sand. And digging into rocks sometimes is difficult. And I thought to myself, wow, what, what are the rocks in my life? One of the things is my character. Lord, has, any, has God ever worked on your character? To the extent that he's hammering and banging away and, and chipping and, and carving out the image of Christ in you. The hope of glory, chip by chip. Oh my goodness. Sometimes the process is arduous. Raising my children. You know, get, getting anger out of my life. In fact, my son's on camera three. I'm going to talk to camera three right now. Am I less angry now than I was even a few years ago? He's got his thumb up. Praise the living God. I've passed the test. And that tenor I promised you for putting your thumb up halfway through the service. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I don't believe in bribery or corruption. Hallelujah. The jurisprudence of Jesus. That's the thing that governs my life. And there's certain things. I don't know what. It, it might be the ability to, to get on with your spouse. You know, for a, for a wife to submit to her husband is a very difficult thing sometimes. Harry. I mean, there's, there's times that we've talked about certain things and I've had to completely shut her down. Equal marriage. There's no such thing as equal marriage. The Bible says the husband is the head of the wife. That's just the way it is. Dude, that's a long chalk. But let me tell you something. It's much better than building your house on the sand. <laughs> Amen, Gloria. Hallelujah. <laughs> 46 years married, Lord Jesus, wow. I, re I remember uh, uh, Ruth's brother, Pastor Robert, he said something very powerful. He said, you know, he said, if you're going to ma get married and stay married for the long term, you don't not just need to be in love. He said, you need a revelation of forgiveness. That is true. That is so true. Yeah. You know, you can wake up all kinds of ways. I love that, that joke that John Osteen used to say. He said, you know, people ask me, do, do you ever wake up grumpy? He said, no, she gets up at six. <laughs> and it, it's like that sometimes. You know, you can roll over in the bed and your, 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 your wife's breath or your husband's armpit or whatever it is, you know, just the lack of... Uh, is, is it me? You know, I've been... I, I've been guilty sometimes of ungratefulness in marriage, not just being grateful for the woman that God gave me to walk down the aisle. Our, our uh, anniversary is coming up soon. Yeah. What are you doing for me? Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine if you, we, we both wake up on our anniversary with our hands out like she's doing? <laughs> My goodness me. And uh, yeah, yeah. Her hands were together and now they're like, yes, I'm ready to catch the great blessing. 
You see, but that, that's the thing. You need a revelation of forgiveness. Why? Every time, you see, sometimes you turn on the Bible and you, you just wish it would say something different. I don't know whether you know this, but for political correct reasons, I won't name which religion it is. But there's a, there's a religion that lives by a book that says that husbands can beat their wives. It says it in plain black and white. You can beat your wife if she displeases you. Well, how many of us, our wives have displeased us occasionally? Lord have mercy. Joey, Joey used to cook this thing of <laughs> pasta and olive oil and a, a, a bit of garlic and like some chili flakes. And she called it dinner. <laughs> I said, my love, forget it. Now, let me tell you, let me tell you, ladies, because I'm getting some glares from the ladies. Let me tell you something. I cook three times a week. My wife cooks three times a week. So we are a very balanced household. And I've never asked my son, hang on a second, camera three. <laughs> Who's the best cook out of me and my wife? Oh, he's ducked. He's ducked. He's ducked. Ducked the question. When the heat was on, he ducked the question. Um, oh, thank you, my love. Oh, I'm the best cook in the family. No, 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 no. I think that's why, but I do all the cooking. When we have guests, I do all the cooking. What do you mean, mostly? Has my wife ever cooked for any one of you in Harvest Church? Just one? No, when with your spouse as well. When husband and wife go, oh, she did. Once, twice. Three times, okay. Okay, maybe four, three and a half. Ah, you see, you could for June Freudenberg. Well done, well done. Was it good, June? Did it? Excellent, okay, okay. So this is, this is, this is the household we live in. Why? Because the Bible says husbands love your wives. I heard Antonio Carlucci. You know Carluccio's, the uh, Italian restaurants? You see them all up and down the country. He said something once, and it's amazing how God can speak to you through somebody who, who's just like a regular Joe Blow. You'd never expect to hear God in their voice. And Antonio Carluccio said this, because they said, what's the secret to your success uh, in the Italian cooking industry to the extent that you've got restaurants up and down the UK and across Europe as well? In fact, worldwide, I think they're in America now. Yeah. And he said this. He said, when a mother, your typical Italian, where's Tom? Oh, he's, Tom, he's gone to work, Don Tomasino. When, when a mother uh, cook for the children, he said, she puts all her love into the cooking. And he said, that's the way. Listen to this now. He said, that's the way I've approached cooking for my customers. He said, I see it like I'm cooking for my children, and I pour all my love into that cooking. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? And let me tell you something. From a banking point of view, right, from an investment banking point of view, the easiest and most successful restaurateurs should be the Italian ones because the cost of the raw materials is so very low and the markup is so very high. But yet the only one to make a real success of it is Carluccio. Why? Because there was, there was something more in the food when he was serving it. There was, there was something more. Do you see what I mean? Now, you think about that. Where would that kind of jurisprudence come from? Do you see what I'm saying? The jurisprudence you live under on an everyday uh, life. In other words, your philosophy of the laws that you live under is very important. The jurisprudence of the UK, you see, was built up until about the 60s, early 70s, was built upon the Bible, on Christian values, right? And then when secular relativism came in, things, things sunk a bit more. And it, it's, they, they started to say things like, well, you know what, you can, you can abort the child, if you want, because the child isn't viable on their own. The child is somehow a byproduct of the mother. But you know, the Bible says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I created, how could you, you know, and they would say, well, you know, what about this? What about that? What about the other? And I've seen the children, I've, I've lived very closely with, with a person who had a child basically from a mistake. 
And that child is so, you'd never know in a million years. Never know in a million years. So full of life, so happy. Why? Because in, in biblical terms, a child is an individual on their own. They were created in the image and likeness of God. How they landed on the earth may have been through rape. It may have been through misfortune. It may have been through some fly guy saying, come around the world with me, my private jet, blah, blah, blah. Right? But, you know, children end up in the earth for all manner of reasons. But every single one of them is special and precious before God. What's that? That's a different way. That's a different jurisprudence. Now, let's see what the Word of God says. Um, Matthew chapter 16. You thought I'd forgotten Matthew 16, right? Praise God, I had. The Lord just reminded me of it. Uh, Verse number 14. Jesus is asking his disciples who they think he is. And in verse 14, they said, Some say that you're John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, but still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? In other words, are you prepared to live under my jurisprudence? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood had not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven, 18. I also say to you that you are Peter, Petros, little rock, and upon this rock, Petra, big rock, the rock of revelation. I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Now, this is, this is the thing. Jesus was setting up a jurisprudence by revelation. He said, up until now, you've lived under law. But I'm saying my church is going to be established on the revelation of who I am. My infrastructure My jurisprudence is going to be established on the revelation of whom I am. Now look at this in the light of the Jesus administration in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1, and we'll start from verse 9. Ephesians 1, 9. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention which he purposed in him, with a view to an administration. That's not the Obama, the Clinton, the Trump, the May, the Cameron, the Major, Lord Jesus help us, administration. That is the Jesus administration. An administration suitable for the fullness of the times. That is the summing up of all things in Christ. Things in the heavens and things on earth. Hallelujah to Jesus. In fact, I wish they'd moved that full spot because that was put in there at the liberty of the translators. And it should have been things in the heavens and things on the earth in him. Because everything that we live by is in him. The regime we live by is in him. And look what he says in verse 15. He says, for this reason too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, whilst making mention of you in my prayers, that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation. There's that thing again, revelation, in the knowledge of him. You can trace... Every single law that was made in Britain from about the year 1000 AD up until about 1967 AD, that's when the Abortion Act came in, into, you can trace them back to the jurisprudence of the Bible. They were all based on the Ten Commandments, which Jesus then distilled down into two commandments. Number one, love God Number two, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the distillation. He says love does no wrong to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So you can take everything back. Now, you can look at other countries. And you can see I was looking at the country of India. Because India is such a fascinating country. It's got a billion people. And yet the law, until it was effectively conquered and colonized by uh, Britain... The the laws that they lived by were effectively village laws. There was a religious 
system, the Hindu system, uh, which is also known as the caste system, which basically said that you can uh, effectively, that if you're born into a certain type of family, because that family is of this caste, then effectively you can look down and mistreat that caste altogether. They are guilty of having done something in a previous life, and that's why they've been born into this family. That was called the caste jurisprudence. And the abuse that came out of that, in fact, my friend in India, Paul Nadam, is a mighty man of God. He has a network there in India of 2,200 and something pastors. And uh, God's been using him all up and down the country of India just to really uh, network churches together and change lives in the most spectacular way. And he is of the lowest caste. He is what they call a Dalit. And the Dalits are the lowest of the caste. I think the Brahmins are the top, and then you have different, uh, is it nine different castes? Because you were under the caste system before you got saved. Wow. Wow. About 15 different castes. Wow. And you see, the caste system was so awful that because of the family you were born into, it didn't matter what you did to redeem yourself. Well, this guy, Paul Nadim, gets saved, right? And I, I took him to Apostle Maldonado was preaching in Mumbai. And I wanted him to see what like power ministry with demonstration of signs following was like. So we took Paul Nadam to a four-star hotel in Mumbai. And it's the first time he said, he said, Pastor P, he said, I didn't even want to lie on the bed. He said, because the bed sheets were so clean and so beautiful laid out. He said, I'd never been like this in a place before. He said, I'd never sat because we flew him from where he was to Mumbai to, to be in this particular meeting. And he said, I'd never flown in an airplane. He said, it was so wonderful. He said, the clouds, they look so beautiful. You know, stuff that you just take, how, how, how many times have you looked over the last while and said, oh, beautiful clouds. It's, it's difficult in a plane if you fly a lot to appreciate anything. Airport terminal, baggage, immigration. And he's just looking at the, the whole thing and thinking, wow, this is just awesome. So wonderful, so beautiful. Now, he's of the lowest caste. He's of the Dalit caste under Hinduism, but he doesn't live under Hinduism. He has a different jurisprudence over his life. Now, get this, guys. This was wonderful. There was a guy who was the... Uh, he must have been a supervisor of the uh, particular ushers in the hotel that we stayed at in Mumbai. And he was a Brahmin, which is the highest caste. And he was, he was stood there very, you know, very perfect stature, kind of like raised to be this top caste kind of guy, right? And there's me and Paul Nadam coming through the hotel. And the Brahmin opened the door for Paul Nadam and stood there and said, thank you, sir. Why? He didn't know he was a Dalit. He would have spat at him for even suggesting that a Brahmin would open the door for a Dalit. Why? They don't know any better. That's the caste system. That's the jurisprudence. You see how blessed we are to have been born and raised under a jurisprudence that was essentially established upon biblical grounds. Wow. So in the political realm, we have to stand and fight for, for, for what's there of the jurisprudence of the kingdom of God. You know, people say to me, well, you know, why, why do you always preach that we need to, uh, you know, stir things up in the political realm and stand for, for, for good laws in the land? Why don't you just let the world go to hell? You know, the Bible says that, uh, like, it's going to go from bad to worse anyway. And I said, well, have you ever called the fire brigade? And they say, yes. I say, well... Uh, the Bible says that God is going to destroy the earth by fire. So what are you doing calling the fire brigade when the fire starts? It's the inevitable end. Right? If you take that to its logical conclusion. And that's part of the deception that we've had. That somehow, because the jurisprudence of the UK was established on biblical grounds, that somehow it doesn't set to modern times. But you look at the times before Christ. You look at Corinth before Christ. Some of the things they were up to, hey, mommy, I mean, you're talking like 50-person marriages, not just three or four. I mean, you're, I mean, you're talking, talking of, of temples devoted to their sex gods, to the extent that the word saint, you know, a holy person, a saint, you know where that comes from? 
from temple prostitutes that used to hang out in the temples to have sex with uh, customers to their sex gods. And those in Christ, those that then hung around the church, those that were workers in the church, were named saints because they were always in church, like St. Prempe here. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? Now, you think about it. We've, we've been told, oh, yeah, it's modern times, hang loose, let it all hang out, etc., etc. But hang on a second, that was actually ancient times before Christ came in and cleaned the whole thing up. Do you understand the deception we've been under? So it's worth, it's worth the fight. The Bible says fight the good fight of faith. I'm fighting for my nation. I'm fighting. You see, you can only be biblically correct or politically correct because the two are starting to separate. So you have to understand which one you stand for. And if that means they lock you up, then, then like, hold out your hands and be nice to the officer. Amen. Absolutely. It's worth it. We're all going to die somehow. What, what will you be remembered for? The person who chickened when push came to shove or the person who stood up and said, no, in the name of Jesus, I'm going to fight for my land. I'm going to pray for my MPs. I'm going to pray for those in government. I'm going to lift up no matter how whack a do our leaders seem to be occasionally. We're only on the ground floor. We never hear what's going up on the ninth, 10th and 11th floors of the political realm. Maybe we'd all run away and buy nuclear bunkers or something if they ever told us. So why not stand and fight for our people? Bless your MP. Send a letter to them and just say, you know, dear so-and-so. That's why we had, when we had Dawn Butler here, the member of parliament, that everyone clapped. Now, I'm a member of the Tory party, man, and I'm clapping for a Labour MP like I was Jeremy Corbyn's love child. <laughs> Dude, I don't care. I'll bless her. She's in authority. In part, I'll pray for her, I'll lift her up in Jesus' name. Father, Lord, whatever she needs, straighten it out. Straighten it out in Jesus' name. Absolutely. It's worth it. Why? The Jesus administration has countless times proven itself better than any other administration that has ever been in the history of man. I'm Paul Norton and I endorse this message. Hallelujah to Jesus. Would you like to stand to your feet? Father, we thank you so much for the great things that you've given us. And Lord, where we've taken your laws and your ways for granted, where we've taken the great things of this land and others in the free world for granted, Lord, we apologize. We, we pray, Heavenly Father, that your word will stand true, will shine forth in every sphere of life, Heavenly Father. When, when governments have strayed from your ways and from your laws, Lord God, they have, they have run into difficult times. When they have tried things that just didn't fit with the Jesus administration, they've ended up losing, losing money, losing resources, losing face, losing all kinds of stuff, losing credibility and reputation. Father, in Jesus' name, strengthen our governments that those who know how to live by the Jesus administration would shine like bright lights, Father, not only in Parliament but in government, not only in government but in the police and in the security services, in the health services, in social welfare, Father, in local administration. The Father Lord, we would see your kingdom come and we would see your will be done in the lives of others, Lord God, just as it is in heaven. We thank you for this nation, Lord God. We bless this nation. Whichever nation's father are, are, are continuing their onslaught, whichever nations are trying to influence the jurisprudence of this land to try and turn us to their ways, Father, we reject them wholeheartedly in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the two great commandments, that we love you and that we will love our neighbor. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for the law of love. Thank you that it changes us, Lord from glory to glory, from strength to strength, and from faith to faith. In Jesus' mighty name, and all God's people said, Amen.